itself. Um, Elizabeth and I are from different parts of Long Island, from very different di different parts of New York, from very different districts, and our mm -hmm. two schools are um, offering very different things. Um, so we're giving you two different perspectives on ways um, that we can try to um, work towards meeting the standards. So um, that's the goal. And I'm, I'm going to speak specifically about an introductory CS class. Um, I um, have been teaching computer science for a long time, um, since the late 90s. Um, I also serve as the uh, FRC robotics team mentor, and I work with the Long Island CSTA chapter. Uh, and I was involved in writing the standards, so I, I guess I can't complain too much about them. <laughs> um, all, all of us, it's now our task to see how do we meet them. Um, I will say that there were a number of revisions that the, the Long Island chapter proposed. And as difficult as the standards may be to meet for all of our students now, they are significantly easier than the draft standards that were proposed in 2019. They are significantly less ambitious. Um, that was the main revision that we suggested and uh, in various specific ways. And that is the main uh, difference that I'm seeing between the current standards and what was originally proposed. Um, Elizabeth, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Thomas Capello, and I teach the Computer Science Pathway at Newburgh Free, Free Academy. I also work with an early college high school program, the Maris Newburgh Part Partnership Program, and we uh, presented some of our work yesterday. So I'm very happy to be here, and Leon and I have had a great time uh, together coordinating this presentation. And Leon is going to go first, and then I will go right after Leon, and uh, we'll uh, move in that. We, we do have a Q&A after each one of us present. So if you want to put things in the chat, I'm just going to be mon monitoring that as we go on uh, for Leon, and he'll do the same for me. And uh, we can take it from there. Does that sound good? Okay. So we've introduced ourselves. Looking at the Jamboard, I can see that we have a few people that are on the administrator side. Most of us are teachers. Um, so hopefully we'll give you know both of you some ideas. And for administrators, it's really a question of how do we, how, you know, what, what can we push to offer? Uh, what classes can we create? But teachers are often involved in class creation too um, and suggesting things like that. So here, here's the class um, that I've had a role in developing. Um, it's an introductory computer science class, basically for all ninth graders. So um, we're moving towards meeting the standards for all of our students. Right now, um, the digital world class, as we call it, um, has about 55% of the ninth grade class enrolled. This is an every other day class. And um, I've been thinking about, you know, who am I missing in this class? Because it's hard to get 100% of kids exposed to computer science. Um, and I think looking at the high school standards, which we'll do in a moment, um, it's very difficult to integrate all of those standards into other classes. At the elementary and middle school level, um, that may be uh, something that could be done with many of them. But for some of the, the standards on, on, um, on uh, computational thinking, it, it really seems best to be putting that into a computer science class. That's my view. Um, so. While I have a very strong background in the field, um, my degree is actually in math, but I've been a computer science enthusiast for a long time. Um, a number of other teachers have taught the class I'm going to talk about uh, over the years. Uh, we had three different math teachers teach it. We had a business teacher. We had a tech teacher. Um, currently, I have all eight sections of it. So it's a, uh, it's a every other day class. So that's four periods of my day is um, this class. And it's supported by this um, Kidoyo platform. And hearing other sessions, uh, many schools have gone with different like learning environments to make it easier on the teachers to have some sort of pathway to follow. Um, some of these environments are free. This one is a paid for environment. Um, and the district um, committed some resources to that. But the ideas I'm going to show you um, could be done with or without the particular platform that we're using. So. Um, there's a big difference between access and exposure, and that was brought out um, quite a bit yesterday. You know, access means you're in a school that has computer science and a kid can choose to take it. But what percentage of our kids are actually exposed to computer science at the high school level? The answer is far, far less than have access to it. You know, like 10% 10, 10 or so, something like that. Um, 
of the kids that have access to computer science are actually exposed to computer science. So when we think about equity um, and trying to bring in uh, groups to computer science that might be underrepresented, just giving them access to it um, is not enough because they're often just not going to choose it. Things are sort of self-perpetuating. If there's a class that generally doesn't have girls in it, girls don't wanna take that class. Uh, I had a, one of my students um, who was in one of my classes told me she was going to drop her business class because she was the only girl in the class. And I told her, well, like, you should stay in the class. I mean, do you like the class? Uh, yeah, I like the class. Like the teacher? Yeah, I like the teacher, but I think I should drop. She's the only girl in the class. So that, that's my point, that these, um, these uh, underrepresented groups tend to be self-perpetuating when kids simply choose what they're going to take. It takes some real deliberate effort on the part of a teacher and the school to draw kids in to classes that are electives that they have to choose to take. They sort of need a reason to take it if they're not the typical kind of kid that's in that class. Um, so one draw in is that computer science is fundamental for every student's success. I'm stealing this slide from Pauline White from Siena College. Uh, on the bottom right here, we see that there's studies that have shown that um, kids that take computer science learn skills that transfer to other disciplines. They're more likely to attend college, they perform better on other subjects because we're teaching them to read with great care we're teaching them to think carefully in methodical linear ways. This leads to this leads to this. We're teaching them different types of problem solving strategies. And we have that general umbrella term of critical thinking. And that applies to lots of different subjects. So we're thinking of it as a, you know, kind of a, a general class everyone should have. Um, so the full implementation of standards for ninth grade starts the fall of 2024. And um, if we're, you know, we can't go from nothing to everybody's doing it. So we need to, as districts, be moving towards that now. There are unique challenges when you have a class offered to everyone. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and I feel that some of the standards that are higher level are really clearly met by our AP classes. Uh, it's more difficult to meet some of the higher standards um, with a, a class that everyone is going to have. Now, so a reasonable goal is that everyone gets exposed to it. Uh, like, for instance, the algebra standards. Kids don't choose to take algebra. They take algebra because everybody takes algebra. And that becomes self-perpetuating, too. So in my district, it's not a graduation requirement to take math your senior year, yet almost everybody does. And they do that because that's what everybody does. It just becomes the culture of the school that you're expected to take math all four years. So the class uh, that we have, the every other day class I teach, is not technically a requirement. It's not a graduation requirement. It's just a class that basically middle school places kids into. I learned recently that um, kids that were dropping chorus got added to my section. So apparently if a kid is taking chorus and also an art class, it didn't fit. But outside of exceptions where it doesn't fit, and there's a lot of those because some kids have, um, they have like an extra period of math because of support. They may have a um, IEP that gives them another support class. And there's only so many periods in the day. So it's hard to get everybody to take it, but that's what we're moving towards. We're at 55% and we need to keep growing that. The standards are broken down into five uh, different categories here. We have computational thinking, network and system design, security, digital literacy, and impact. So I'm just gonna kind of go through those one at a time and talk about how um, the class tries to meet those. So computational thinking, uh, some of these are high level, like I said, they're not all covered in my class. Uh, on the other hand, uh, standard one, says create a, a simple digital model that makes predictions of outcomes. And that's basically covered in math classes at my school because they're using a graphing calculator, they might be using a spreadsheet, they're doing regression, and they're making predictions based on data. Uh, standards four and five, we have a scratch block-based programming language. And using that, they can implement algorithms. And um, here's a really simple example that pretty much all my students were able to pull off uh, where they were given uh, a library that they had to use that they didn't create. And then they had to basically write code to let this little guy move around the screen. And the hit there, we have initial logic that says, if I'm touching green, make that sound. If I'm touching yellow, make that sound instead. And the part of the code that makes the sound, they didn't really write that. They're using an external library, which just means other functions that they have access to that they didn't create. Uh, to build that. So um, that's that's uh, 
you know, a simple example of doing something that meets a standard that is not super high level. Uh, standard six, um, it says demonstrate how at least two classic algorithms work and analyze the trade-offs related to two or more algorithms for completing the same task. So that's what I would consider, um, you know, a uh, very high level standard. I'm noticing in the chat, Amy Fox says that she has 85% participation in the mandatory ninth grade class. That is fantastic. It really um, is. That, that's just absolutely amazing. So, and you know, the, it's in quotes mandatory because if it was mandatory, mandatory, everyone would take it. So we have a culture where most kids take it and that's what my district kind of needs to move towards. And I, I think having these things as standards that we expect all kids to meet will basically force districts hands in putting more kids into it. But, um, you know, some of these standards are really pretty high level. So can, can anybody even name a classic algorithm? In the chat, type your favorite classic algorithm. What's a classic algorithm? Sorting, yeah, that, that's like the ultimate classic. And, you know, that's a fairly difficult concept to get your AP kids to wrap their brain around. Um, uh, red and black trees, bubble sort, sure. So, I mean, I, I could probably get many of my ninth graders to understand that. Um, now we're gonna do two or more different algorithms, so two different kinds of sorting, uh, and show how they accomplish the same task in different ways. Uh, search is another classic algorithm. That might actually be easier because you can, hey, you can search by sorting at the beginning and go through it. Or if, you're, if your list happens to be sorted, you can be smart and say, let me guess it's in the middle first, and then do what's called a binary search to try to find it that way. Um, so it, that's not a topic I've attempted to give my ninth graders, but it's definitely um, covered in um, in the AP class. And yeah, to guess the number between one and a hundred is a simple example of a searching algorithm that, you know, I've even had kids program a game like that. We could just play that game together and we could claim that we have, <laughs> we've covered that standard to some degree. Um, designing or remixing a, a program that uses a data structure to maintain changes to relate piece of data. That's content standard uh, seven. Okay, so can we think of a data structure that we can get most of our kids to understand? Because that sounds pretty high level. What is like a simple data structure? A list. It sounds very complicated, but a list is a data structure. The point is we're storing more than just one thing, right? We're gonna have a bunch of things. So one of the projects my kids had, um, again, this is a block-based language, this is a publicly available language, just the particular platform where I have access to like projects and then I can keep track of who solved the project. That's specific to the Kadoyo platform. But the, um, the actual language here in this tool, you'll see similar things with a bunch of different resources because they're freely available. It's an open source project started by MIT uh, more than a decade ago. So what is this project here? What did this kid do? Um, he's supposed to build a shopping cart. All right, so apparently I can buy a doll um, and then I want to buy an apple and then I want to buy a bat because this is a weird store that sells food items and Halloween items in the same place. And then I'm going to check out and it tells me I bought an Amy doll, uh, an apple, a bat, and I bought Amy doll twice. And there's my total and there's my list. So the kid must have used a data structure to store this car, and we can basically see that list right there. So that meets the standard. That's a, a, a relatively simple project that many of our kids could make. Uh, eight talks about control structures to create a computer program for practical intent, personal expression, or some societal issue. So almost any program you make is going to use control structures. Any program that's interesting at all has control structures in it. So we can just say they're making a program that does something. And uh, it, it's, it has some personal expression, like maybe it shows some creativity. Um, and then standard nine talks about uh, user input because whenever we get user input, we have to make sure that they don't type the wrong thing. So he, I'll do the user input one first because this is pretty simple. Um, kids made a calculator. Almost all my students were successful in getting this done. And so the first number I type five, second number I type 10, and operator, I don't know, how about question mark? Ooh, how about the caret symbol? I want to do a power operator. Now it did say do plus minus times to divide. So the computer told me that was invalid. And that was the point of that standard is that we can, um, you know, sort of test user input 
and make sure that things are valid and then respond appropriately when they're not valid. So that's that's that one. Uh, this is a fun little website that a guy made. Um, this is actually for a hackathon project last year. So the, as part of my class, they also learned some web design things and he just created some clever, um, clever blurbs about the various different Greek gods and um, found uh, a 3D model online and integrated that into the website so you can kind of move your favorite Greek god around. There's Poseidon and all of his worry. Uh, he was rather proud of that and the team was rather proud of what he pulled off there. Um, user input again and some creativity. You can, uh, kids made a little choose your own adventure game. And as you move through this, you get to decide which way to go. So maybe we, we go over here and we get to that one and we land a different spot. Uh, other kids made a similar choose your own way game where um, there's a little bit more dialogue and it tells you, you know, where you've landed and describes the scene. So it sort of mixes in creative writing in with this. Um, and that could be a way we can integrate personal expression into a project, allow kids to write creatively and, um, you know, use that creative juice. And I think that's one really great thing about computer science is it gives a kid a chance to exercise creativity and kids can um, solve the same project with very different solutions, showing their creativity. And also it's a way to bring in kids with different abilities. So the stronger student gets the project done faster, adds to it, makes it way more complicated and interesting. And your struggling student just barely gets it done, but they learn something in the process and they accomplish something. Uh, and I think that's something that computer science teachers learn we really have to do when you have a wide range of ability, you need to create projects um, which can have a range of outcomes uh, in terms of what kids are able to handle. I'm going to go through the rest of these pretty quickly. Uh, network and system design, um, in addition to talking about like projects and programming, kids learn binary numbers. We talk a little bit about how um, technology is embedded in different um, commercial items like refrigerators and even toasters and cars. And Internet of Things, what IoT refers to, is small objects that actually have an internet connection, like a thermostat. So um, kids learn about that. And um, not, not too much the troubleshooting aspect of it. That happens in class on occasion. Uh, the troubleshooting standard um, sort of requires an environment where kids can plug things in and unplug them and, and uh, make that happen. Um, we discuss a little bit about the internet, what it actually means. Um, they've used cloud storage for years, but they might not fully appreciate what cloud storage actually is. And um, we talk about um, this emerging technology thing. This is actually a very simple standard. I mean. We obviously have way more things online than we used to, and we have a lot more streaming. So there's a lot more demand on internet connectivity. So like standards for what is considered a fast internet connection have gone way up because people now are watching 4K movies at home streamed over the internet. We cover a little bit of history of that, uh, what the internet was originally for, what the web was originally for, and how that's evolved over time. Um, and then we have them actually build some web pages. For cybersecurity, the way I handle this standard is I basically um, give kids some background vocabulary, like what is phishing, a virus, a worm, Trojan, DDoS, things like that. Um, I haven't talked about this triad, um, but I'm gonna add that to what I discussed this year after looking at this. Uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And the way they um, uh, you know, put their own spin on this is they give a presentation on some cyber crime from the last 10 years. So I give them um, a project where they have to basically uh, look at some famous hacks. <laughs> um, and uh, I give them some options of various famous hacks and um, write down what happened. You know, what, what, was, um, what was stolen? How was it stolen? How did we allow this to happen? And that kind of thing. So they work in pairs on that. And I think it helps them uh, appreciate the importance of that. Um, we cover cryptography just in terms of understanding how it works a little bit. This is just, you know, essentially content vocabulary. Um, and digital literacy, this standard is really integrated throughout the course because throughout the course, um, they are, you know, producing digital artifacts, which is basically just some kind of graphic or diagram um, as part of what they're doing in their project. So for instance, for the cyber crime uh, project, they had to create some original graphic that helps understand helps the audience understand what happened 
like what percentage of CVS customers were exposed, had their credit card stolen as a result of that hack um, through the photo sharing site. Maybe like a, you know, circle graph might be a good approach to that, different things. Um, they talk about using advanced tools to revise and publish a complex uh, digital artifact or collection artifact. So I'm not sure I can claim that we use any advanced tools. I, I would consider Photoshop an advanced tools and they can take a Photoshop class if they want to. Um, advanced tool, I think, is, is rather relative. Is, is, uh, is Google Slides an advanced tool? I mean, I guess it's pretty advanced technologically in terms of what goes on behind the scenes. We don't think of it as a very hard tool to use. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think that one's open to interpretation, but they definitely do produce original things. We just think about the term literacy, right? Literacy means the ability to communicate, to be able to read and also write, to communicate in, in writing. So um, digital literacy means a student can do that using other digital tools. They can communicate by publishing something on the web. They can communicate by creating a visual graphic. They can communicate by creating a video and editing it. So that's what we're trying to give our students the ability to do with digital literacy. The citizen, uh, citizenship piece is actually entirely covered um, in terms of the practical aspects like strategy that supports safety and security, learning seven, that's actually supported by the new health curriculum in my school. Um, and I, I really think that that's where that belongs because that's part of being responsible and being healthy is being responsible with your digital, uh, digital identity and being responsible for mental health, the mental health of yours and other people, um, your classmates. So um, I'm really happy with the way the health department has decided to rewrite their curriculum and integrate that. I cover some of the uh, technical aspects of this, like client server discussion and the fact that when a message is sent, um, it doesn't just live on your friend's device, it also lives in a server somewhere. And um, law enforcement's very happy to find deleted messages of criminals as they share their plans because things are saved on servers basically forever. Um, impacts of covering, I don't act, impacts of computing, I don't actually cover. So um, thinking about how we you know, need to move towards the standards, uh, I too have some work to do in thinking about how I can better align my curriculum with the standards and maybe add some things to it that I did not previously do. And that's the work that my district is involved in this year. Any questions? There are a few questions in, in the chat, uh, beginning with Amy is asking if it's a full year or a half year course. It's a half year class every other day. And it alternates with a class that helps them with English. So we basically years ago, we said the two deficits of our kids coming into high school, their English and grammar skills and research skills are not good enough for many of them to be successful in what's gonna be demanded of them in English and social studies. And they need more digital literacy and more understanding of how to use technology tools. And in my class, of course, also serves as a, a feed-in to, um, to AP classes. I should mention about that, that um, our enrollment has gone up significantly um, in AP classes after getting kids to take this, this um, current version of the digital role class. And um, we have much better gen gender parity than we used to. It's still the case that girls are underrepresented in my AP classes, but they're less underrepresented. And it was the case that APCSA was offered every other year. And this year we offered it two times in a row. And I have a full section of 24 kids, um, which is not a ton, but I have only, we have only about 200 kids per grade. So in a small school, um, we're moving in the right direction. So it's it, having lots of kids take an intro class has proven to be a great way to get more kids to take the AP classes too. Other questions you noticed, Liz? Two, yes, two questions from Jocelyn. She's curious about uh, if you have the write-up of the hack lesson, the I famous do, hacks lesson. Yeah, so about the write-ups, the slides are gonna be published. Um, some of the links in the slides might not work for you. I can see what I can do with that because they're not publicly viewable, but the write-up for the hacks lesson actually is there. Now, not, not the lesson, not the content of me explaining what a phishing attack is, um, but there is um, write-ups on what the project was. Uh, and we're gonna share our contact info. So if there's other specific things you'd like, just drop me an email and I can, I can share the things with you. And just, just a quick question from Jocelyn as well. Uh, what school district are you with? 
Beth Page, Long Island. We're right in the middle of Nassau and Suffolk, uh, middle, middle class district. We have about 25% of our kids are on free and reduced lunch. Amy Fox, uh, what do you use for your web design? Straight up HTML. There is um, a platform that gives us the ability to upload that to a web server. So the site that I showed you, it was actually like encore.oyosites.com. So uh, part of the um, platform my district pays for, it's a, it's a basic like a per user fee. Um, they are, every kid is given a little bit of space on that platform's web server. And do I enter CSS at all? Yes. Uh, many of the kids have seen some HTML in eighth grade, and so I do quite a bit with CSS. Mm -hmm. Amy shares, uh, you're, she's impressed with how many of the standards you're covering in your ninth grade in your ninth grade work. And I'm impressed with how many kids are taking yeah. the class that, that Amy offers. That is amazing. That's terrific. That's terrific. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Here, here we are at part two. So I have a little bit of a di different story, and I thought it was in in interesting to share uh, this. Uh, again, my name is Elizabeth Th Thomas Capello. I teach at Newburgh Free Academy main, main campus. I teach the computer science path pathway for the district. Uh, our school is uh, located right in the heart of New in Newburgh, New York. We are about 48% uh, Hispanic. We're about 25% uh, black and about 25% white. So we have a very uh, diverse population and a typical graduating class is around 700. So uh, our computer science pathway is actually quite new. Uh, we began in 2018 and my job, I actually came up from, the, just a quick uh, about me, I came up from the technology department and I actually came from that, I was a graphic design teacher. So that's how I entered into computer science, but I really didn't enter computer science first. So I was brought up to the high school. There was a teacher that had retired. I was very interested in his job. He retired earlier than I had anticipated. I was very happy with my job as an instructional technology facilitator for a long time. And uh, I now uh, had this had this uh, job that I had had wanted for a long time, but wasn't quite sure as to what direction to take it. I work under the CTE component of Newburgh. And with that, our focus was really developing the students for a possible career. There's still a bit of emphasis on that now, but it really was how can we get the students to take a type of test in order to pass this CTE test and what we were using at the time, uh, or what they were looking at was the not Nocti. And I just put that in just a little historical context. So I'm so curious to go back and listen to the recordings and really understand thoroughly uh, the involvement of the CTE and how that's going to impact my own uh, department. So I'm very excited about that. There was a little bit, you know, a little use of the New York State st standards, not a lot, not not as much as now, and really focusing on digital literacy a little bit more. Uh, the approvals came in pretty quickly. Uh, however, now that we have the approvals, we're finding that it's quite a bit of a challenge in order for us to implement any changes to our pathway. Uh, when we want to make a name change or we want to really tweak the classes as we evolve and grow, that is necessary for any growing program, we really have found that that is a bit, bit of a challenge, takes a lot of planning, has to go through many departments in order to uh, occur. So next slide, thank you, Leon. So in 2018, and oh, this is our, that, that was our first class. You can see our little tiny computer lab. It was a, a small little tiny skinny room that they threw together in a closet for us. <laughs> so there we were with some with with some old Macs. And uh, so where we are now, uh, from 2018 uh, to 2020, we started an introductory uh, to computer science class. It was really based in web web design, uh, uh, an issue that we have is. Uh, 
because of the web, because we were based out of the C CTE, we were really concerned about it was more of a career path for, for these students. So we taught HTML, CSS, uh, a little bit of ja JavaScript, uh, but very, very small amount. And it was grades nine through 12 mixed. We still are a mixed introduction to CS class. Uh, it's now called computer science principles, uh, but it is a mixed class. And next slide, thank you. So when COVID hit, uh, that transitional uh, component for all schools really allowed myself and my CTE director to step back and see the direction of our program and the way we we, we needed to take that. We were really taking in, into consideration the changing landscape um, of computer science itself. And we can all probably say that we've noticed between 2020, maybe even 2019, and now a dramatic shift in what our classes actually look look like. So we saw that we needed to really um, change this. We needed to look into look into Python. We really needed to look into introductory programming. And what does that look like for our, our school? So COVID allowed me as a teacher to do an enormous amount of training. I, I um, was able to do quite a bit. I could probably share a lot on that. But I uh, I also work with a um, our early college high school program and took advantage of a lot of their courses that, that I was allowed to take uh, myself. So we really changed from a college and career ready C CTE focus uh, to developing students in, in a in a um, computer science path pathway. The link to our computer science pathway, I believe, is on the next slide. And we have an enormous growth of students. Uh, our our link is that the link is is right there. If you want to just click on that link, if you wouldn't mind, that's just a little snippet. But the link itself is the uh, is the is the heading. So when we share our slides, uh, that uh, that pathway will all be shared. So our course is still only a, a two quarter, quarter course. We are lo looking to have that changed, uh, but it is is only a two quarter, quarter course. The students move into a web web design class, uh, and that is a two structure course. And then they move into AP Computer Science A. So. Uh, at 2000, where we are at present is, uh, just can you go back to that slide, please? Thank you. So we cover a broad range of our foundational topics, uh, programming, our problem solving, al 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 algorithm development, data collection, data privacy and security, uh, a lot of cult cultural and society impacts of computing and um, machine learning. This does serve similar to Leon as a pre-course for our AP Computer Science A. Next slide would be good. Thank you. So our uh, computational thinking, let me check out my other monitor here. here. So we have uh, our problem solving exercises. I do have a couple of student examples. If you wouldn't mind clicking on them, I think this is the only slide with student examples, maybe LinkedIn. Sure, that one is great. Uh, the students do develop a, uh, um, we look at problem solving, algorithm development. They do have to really uh, draw out uh, the steps. Uh, that is an exercise that we do at the beginning of, of each, each year to really just get the idea of this sequence and, and looking at how, uh, how our algorithms are um, developed. This is a little movie re remix. We do use Scratch. Uh, that is, is available for you to click on and use. It's just a quick re remix. Uh, that allows our students to really see the sequence and uh, how, we can, how we can problem solve from beginning to end. Thank you very much on that. Excellent. Did you want to see another example? We're going to move on to the no, next I think that's, that's fine. We can go ahead and move on. Thank you. So with our computational thinking and the standards that we addressed, I, I didn't really speak about the little component of, of the uh, standards, but with the standards that we addressed with this, what we've really been focusing on is thinking about how we shift our students 
from a block base to a a um, to a the the actual programming la la language and what does that look like for students um, in Newburgh when the students begin kindergarten the graduation rate is a little bit is a little bit tough and so when they begin their school in Newburgh the whole focus of their of their school from beginning to end is walking across academy field so getting the students to graduate and we really want to uh when i have the students um thinking about their uh, identity what does this look like for them in their future so we talk about them as uh, computer scientists so to try to lessen a little bit of the co cognitive load because we are dealing with so many learners in our, our classroom we really try to think about uh how can we make an easy transition from that block base to our script so everybody is uh, not lost we really are our classes are very very large and how can we keep everybody you know on board and really thinking about that feeling that uh we can work in the technology field this we can use this as a uh springboard and a benchmark for us to graduate with and use and so this is an example of a scratch program and the second script is a python script the scratch programs in the python in the python lesson are completely mirrored so again with the block base it's it's how can we take off the load of just all of a sudden moving into a um a python based lesson we do use coding rooms as our platform and uh we use scratch for probably five or six of our lessons before we get into Python in our introductory course. Thank you very much. We can move on. Uh, we do cover society and e ethics with our computing. Uh, I have a couple of examples. We have uh, defining what is a computer innovation, uh, understanding the effects of technology on uh, society. Uh, we do have a couple of student examples of innovations. Uh, one is a uh, one is just a Google slide uh that they've created the other is a google site so uh looking at that uh with our innovations we also try try to emphasize oh did that not open oh okay i'll fix that thank you very much i'm glad to see see it on the other end thank you so could you go would you mind going back to the innovation i had one thought understanding the effects of technology in society so we think about our students as consumers of technology. Uh, we want them to think about where the past was, but how they can become how they can become um, not just consumers but producers. And with that, let's move on to our next slide. Uh, we continue. We continue this. I have a uh, nope. The, the one before it. The Padlet link. We had a, a Padlet link on it. Okay, this may or may, may not open as well. Oh, there we go. So we so we do get into a little bit of machine learning. I use a program called Teachable uh, Machine where the students actually train, uh, they actually can uh, train uh, the computer um, to understand their hand signals. They can actually bring things in from uh, their home and they can train the computer to understand hand symbols. Uh, and it's a terrific uh, program just to introduce the concepts of uh, machine learning a, li a little bit. That was on the back slide, the other slide. We, you don't have to click on that, but th this is a terrific uh, product, which uh, is, is great to just introduce a little bit of machine lear learning. So next slide would be good. Uh, we do in integrate uh, digital li literacy and, and citizenship throughout. Uh, we do work with pair, pair pro programming. We, we have a lot of students at multiple di different levels in our, our, our school. I do consider that a, a little bit of, um, uh, I do consider that kind of a digital, digital citizenship component. Uh, the students do na navigate multiple platforms. We also have a very robust computer science uh, education week, again, developing the students as, as learners. Sorry, my internet, there we go. Okay, my internet's a little bit 
off today. There we go. Oh, okay. Hopefully I stay in. Okay, she seems to have uh, have frozen in time here. Um, let me just jump to the next slide. Um, and I think, you know, we both discussed this. Every computer science teacher um, needs to differentiate instruction for different levels. Um, if, if you have an elective class or you have a class everyone has to take, um, either way, you're going to be um, hitting honors kids and kids that are that are struggling and may have remediation services and other things. Am um, I back now? You're back. You're back. Okay. I just, okay. I okay. Thank you. Uh, I could hear you. Time. That was amazing. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yes, we, we really, that, that's a big, big struggle. And as we grow and evolve and, uh, really, uh, look at, at, at where we're, we're mo moving towards right now. A major challenge is really scaffolding the programming lessons. Uh, I've implemented a lot of uh, Parsons problems before they even get to the actual work of, of coding. How can we make that How can we make that load a little bit less for, for our students? Um, I've heard of a Parsons problem. It's when the kid basically has all the right answers, but in the wrong order. So it's, it's an easier way to get them to understand um, logical thinking when they don't have to write the code themselves, but they need to understand it well enough to put things in the right order. Mm -hmm. I actually uh, have a great link. I'll, I'll find that and drop drop that in where you can create create your own. It's a terrific uh, it's a terrific uh, link. And the uh, when we started finding curriculum resources was a major major problem. Of course, it's not now. Uh, there are so many, and we're so fortunate to have that now, but it was a big, big problem. Uh, lack of professional learning community. I am the only uh, one in, in my district, the only teacher that teaches computer science right now. And so in my, in my I do have my CTE department. Of course, my CTE department also consists of auto body and cosmetology. So we really don't have a lot in common. Uh, so I have really found that CSTA has been great for the uh, for my my PLC. Uh, our classroom infrastructure, uh, advocating for resources. Uh, we have an excellent computer lab. However, the equipment is very, very old. All of that advocating comes down to me. Uh, and in addition to our day jobs, you know, working to get everything that we need um, is it can be a struggle. Our district is wonderful as far as getting us uh, any any curriculum resources that we might need. Uh, supplies is fine, but the technology, uh, the actual in, the actual infrastructure uh, comes through a different department, so it's a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, the guidance offices I have found, uh, and I'm sure you all might have this issue as well, um, you know, really getting the guidance offices to understand the students and uh, how how they can how they can put them through the pathway um, and just understanding our courses. It is a large it is a large um, department. Uh, so I find that a lot of the recruiting comes down to me, which is great. I feel I can be a strong advocate for my course. I'm concerned, you know, uh, uh, what does that look like, you know, if I wasn't here but to be able to do that. I do see a, a lack of females. I re really appreciated Leon. I love to listen to other te teachers. I appreciated his lack of females that he may have in his conversation that he had with his business uh, student or, or the student that was in a course where she was the only female. Uh, this year has been particularly a uh, particularly tr um, difficult with that. I thought because I am a female, I teach computer science, that would not be an issue. That is not the case at all. So uh, a major goal of mine for, for it's probably the number one goal is to dramatically increase the number of females in uh, my classes. Right now, I'm at, I would say, probably 85% male. It's very, very large. So next slide. Thank you. I just want, wanted to put uh, a couple of curriculums. Uh, some 
our standalone computer science cur curriculum. Somebody wrote in their CMU, uh, and that's a great one. I'm actually going to add that to, to the slide before I share that. Uh, that should be in here. The, the Carnegie Mellon uh, the Carnegie Mellon piece is really good. Uh, some of them are integrated. For example, the Project Guts, you can integrate with, with science. I don't know if we have any other teachers here that are specifically, uh, you know, not, not, not just CS, but uh, other core sub subject te teachers. And the Bootstrap is in integrated with algebra. But these uh, other ones are sole uh, computer science curriculum. If, if anybody is starting their own and want to check out some uh, that they're not aware of. I just wanted to put that slide in. And next one, that might be it. Yes, I, I think that is it. So uh, we do have, if you want to click on that link, would you mind just clicking on the computer science pathway link? Thank you. We do have a great deal of CS Awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna add, add that in too. Thank you, exploring site, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I just wanted a little benchmark writing that down. Thank you, Eric and CSA. So th this is our computer science pathway. We um, have several links. Our pathway course is linked in the second uh, in the second uh, bench benchmark piece over in the um, over in the, the uh, top right navigation. Uh, yeah. Yes. So our, yeah. our our pathway courses are here. Uh, I all, we also have the early college high school program linked, and uh, any information you would like to kind of um, discover a little more more about about us, please feel free to do. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been it's been wonderful to present with this. Is there any questions that I can answer? Yeah, like make code too. Any questions?